There was uh, just last month, this is not old, in December, on the 2nd and 3rd of December, the World Health Organization hosted the Global Vaccine Safety Summit. This was also a 20-year anniversary for the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety. This was all of the heads, the world leaders on vaccine science and safety gathered together in Geneva, Switzerland. To start this presentation out with was a presentation made by Dr. Heidi Larson. She's an anthropologist that works with the, um, what's it called? Vaccine Confidence Project. The Vaccine Confidence Project, she's the director. So she's been investigating the confidence around vaccines. You've seen a, a, a lot of news about the growing questioning environment, but what I'm trying to look at here is where does safety come up in the broader look at where the confidence problem is? And again and again, safety rises to the top. This was in the U.S. Um, I've uh, done a lot in, the, in Europe. Um, this was our first uh, we developed a vaccine confidence index, which we've been running for five years. Uh, we have under review now an, an analysis of 250,000 people in 148 countries. I was actually surprised at Europe being so acutely skeptical when it came to safety. I knew other countries were having some issues, but um, it was uh, quite um, acute in, in Europe. Uh, when we try to disaggregate that by different kinds of reasons, safety is the, is the biggest issue. Safety is the biggest issue. Fear of side effects, low sense of risk. The other thing that's a trend and an issue is not just confidence in providers, but confidence of healthcare providers. We have a very wobbly health professional front line that is starting to question vaccines and the safety of vaccines. That's a huge problem because to this day, any study I've seen, and we're constantly looking on any studies on, in this space, still the, the most trusted person on any study I've seen globally is the healthcare provider. And if we lose that, we're in trouble. Listen to what she's saying. Not only is it people that you have been affecting by sharing your stories and sharing the high wire and walking in and, and, and showing people like the vaccine safety white paper saying, well, read this. Many of you were handing this to your doctors. Many of you are questioning your doctors, asking very, very reasonable questions that they can't answer. Listen to what she's saying. The, the, the front line, their soldiers for this issue are the doctors. Everybody looks up to, she says, to the doctors. That's the number one person that people believe in, but that person is becoming wobbly. That person, we are all shocked to find, including her, but especially me, that they are starting to question vaccines themselves. The doctors themselves are questioning the vaccines. Isn't that mind-blowing? So we're having an even bigger effect than we realize. They're not admitting that to us, but they're admitting that to the World Health Organization when they're having to fill out a survey. Yeah, no, I'm not really confident about these things. Some of the things are like, I'm especially not confident giving a flu shot to a pregnant woman because I haven't seen a safety study on that. But what's really amazing is when she starts to drill in on why would the doctors be lacking this confidence and what are we going to have to do about it, listen to what she admits. We've talked about it earlier. Some of the challenges are when the frontline uh, professionals are starting to question or they don't feel like they have enough confidence about the safety to stand up to it to the person asking them the questions. I mean, most medical school curriculums, even nursing curriculums, I mean, in medical school, you're lucky if you have a half day on vaccines, never mind keeping up to date with all this. What? Wait a minute. I thought Dell was exaggerating. I thought he was spreading misinformation when he said that, vac that, that doctors are barely trained at all in vaccines. I've told you, it's like a paragraph. You're lucky if it's a day. She said, listen to what she said. This is the head investigator looking at vaccine safety, why it's an issue, why are doctors wobbling? 
because she says to the whole room, nobody said, boo, hiss, that's not true. They all nodded as she said, as we know, doctors and even nurses are lucky if they get a half day of education on vaccination. I spend a lot of time talking, particularly in the last six months, uh, with tech companies, Facebook, WhatsApp, Pulsar, Twitter, Instagram, WeChat, um, Weibo. Um, they have a lot of fingers pointing at them to fix, fix the misinformation problem. But it's not so simple. One, the biggest problem is a lot of it's not misinformation. Our problem is, as we've heard in the last 48 hours, that there's not anything 100%. And what actually can legally, without creating a censorship thing, can we absolutely say this is misinformation? Because we have a lot of ambiguity in the safety field, and we have to come to terms with that. So we have to think about it differently than deleting misinformation but building trust so people are willing to put up with a certain amount of risk because they believe in it enough. They believe in our work, what we're doing, and that it's in their interest. This is a, uh, a physicist I'm working with at, at GW in George Washington University. It's actually an Oxford um, uh, physicist. These are, he is, had worked primarily on different kinds of uh, social networks, but I was fascinated by his methods, and I said, listen, you should look at the vaccine space. So each of these blobs, as he calls them, um, are, are communities, like a Facebook page, which are, or Arnica, the, this group of mothers. So the green dots are undecided, neutral communities, people interested in vaccines but asking questions. Um, the red are the uh, clearly questioning anti-communities, and the blue are the positive. Already you can see the blue is a tighter group, and the red more, more out there. Now, if you look at the numbers, what he was looking at was over a, a period of time, literally a couple months, what is the recruiting pace of the blue positive versus the red in them converting the undecided to their camp or the other. The, it was a 500% faster recruitment by the negative um, than the positive uh, vaccine community. That's, uh, that's fast. And these are not, this is not hypothetical. This. Our biggest, one of our biggest challenges I think now is getting rid of the term anti-vax, getting rid of the hostile language, and starting to have more conversations, to be open to questions, to make people feel like they shouldn't be judged when they're asking questions. As crazy as those questions might seem to you, as, as stupid as they might seem, or as ignorant as they might seem, uh, we can't risk losing another person's confidence in safety right now. I think that one of our biggest challenges is, as, as Bob said this morning or yesterday, we're in a unique position in human history where we've shifted uh, the human population to vaccine-induced, um, to dependency on vaccine-induced immunity. And that's on the great assumption that populations would cooperate. And for many years, people lined up. The six vaccines, people were there. They saw the reason. We're in a very fragile state now. We have developed a world that is dependent on vaccinations. We don't have a choice but to make that effort. There's a lot of safety science that's needed. And um, without the good science, we can't have good communication. So although I'm talking about all these other contextual issues, and communication issues, it absolutely needs the science as the backbone. You can't repurpose the same old science to make it sound better if you don't have the science that's relevant to the new problems. So we need much more investment in safety science.